Uh, welcome everyone to the Hero Stakeholder Summit. I'm Deborah Martin, a professor in the geography department, and I co lead Hero with John Rogan, who unfortunately could not be here. Um, so he is out of town at the moment, but uh, he left because he had every confidence in all of these guys. So Hero stands for, I think everybody knows this, but I feel the need to say nonetheless, Human Environment Regional Observatory. Um, and so, as you may know, we uh, every year the idea of a regional observatory is continuous observance over time um, in a particular area. And so, for the past few years, we've been looking at tree planting in the Green and the Gateway City program, which you guys will talk more about. Um, but we also have established in the last few years uh, a nascent and emerging partnership with some researchers at UMass. Um, working primarily under the um, supervision of Theodore Eisenman, who's a professor at UMass in landscape architecture. And so we have something a little different this year. Uh, rather than just have the Clark side present, we're just going to have a very short uh, presentation from some of the hero researchers about what they're doing in terms of looking at tree preferences uh, among people in some gateway cities and connected areas uh, in Massachusetts. So I'm really happy to welcome them as well. Um, so we're going to do that first, and then I think they'll just turn it directly over to um, the, the Clark researchers who will introduce themselves as they go. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly tell you who the UMass students are. So we have Alicia Coleman, um, who's not going to present, but she's here, working with Joanna Concalves and Irene Gap, who are going to present to us now. Thanks. So we, this exercise 
we want uh, to understand what which kind of trees people like, their location from uh, whether on the public road or in the private land, and the density of trees. Oh, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk, talk about the procedures for the location. We choose the diversity areas where we can get a variety of people, so um, markets, downtown, sidewalks, and libraries. And for, uh, we also use different timing, um, so weekends, weekdays, from morning to evening. We hope to attain feedback from both people who live in and outside of the parking room. Um, and then um, when we approach people, we first make sure they're not occupied to avoid dis um, disturbance. And then um, we introduce ourselves, the uh, purpose of the survey, the university we're from, and then in return for completing the survey, participants are given snacks and water. Summer research of the Greening the Gateway Cities program. Uh, so the HERO uh, team includes six undergraduate students Novak Chen, myself, Sadie Murray, uh, Shannon Rowe, Ben Ryan, and Cindy Sellers. And we're mentored by two graduate students, Nick uh, Jaron <laughs> and Mark Healy, and we are directed by our professors, Deb Martin and John. So here's an outline uh, for our presentation. We'll start off with information about the HERO program, the Green the Gateway Cities program. Then we'll move on to the tree survey, how we conducted it, and some of our findings. We'll go into the interviews that we conducted, how those were done, and what we've learned. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with some overall findings, recommendations, and future goals moving forward researching the Green the Gateway Cities program. So 2019 is the HERO program's 20th year at Clark University. HERO, which Deb mentioned, stands for H uh, Human Environment Regional Observatory, and it's a research program that focuses on studying human environment relationships we see in Massachusetts. For the past several years, HERO has focused on urban tree health and tree stewardship, and now since 2017, the progress and preliminary impacts of the Green Gateway Cities program. As a part of this program, Hero Fellows spend the summer in the field conducting or collecting data and conducting interviews, as well as analyzing this data to report back to you what we found. We spend the following academic year in a directed study with Deb and John using this data uh, to conduct individual research projects. And then Hero Fellows present their findings throughout the year at Clark University Fall Fest, Academic Spree Day to the USDA, and at the American Association of Geographers Conference. So, as mentioned before, HERO has recently been focusing on the Green Gateway Cities program. The GGCP is a Massachusetts state program with the goals of increasing canopy cover in Massachusetts gateway cities in order to increase energy efficiency in these areas. With each gateway city, within each gateway city, environmental justice neighborhoods with low tree canopy, old housing stock, high wind speeds, and large renter populations are targeted for tree plantings. The GGCP also partners with community organizations in each city to help get the community involved with the program. Out of the 14 participating gateway cities, the HERO program has researched the impacts of tree planting in Revere, Chelsea and Holyoke in 2017, and Chicopee and Fall River in 2018. And this year, our team has focused on the ongoing programs in Lemonster and its field in the red on the map. So what exactly is a gateway city? A gateway municipality is a designation in Massachusetts state law in the Economic Development Incentive Program. It includes cities with populations between 35 and 250,000, and a median household income and average educational attainment that is below the state average. These cities tend to be places where manufacturing once boomed and now face unique social and economic opportunities and challenges as the social, economic, and technological landscapes shift in Massachusetts. So here's a look at Lemonster, one of the two cities we've been looking at this summer. Uh, Lemonster, once a center of plastic production in the region, now has large sectors in management, sales, and education. 
Uh, manufacturing, however, remains an important component of Gloucester's industry. We've displayed over here uh, 2018 estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau for Leominster, which show the metrics of population, household income, and education that are within the definition of a gateway city. A majority of people identify as white in Leominster, and 17.8% of people identify as Hispanic or Latino. Um, which, as you'll see in a minute, is uh, quite different than in Pittsfield. Here, we also have a map of the planting zone in downtown Leominster, showing the estimated median income throughout the area. We're uh, displaying median income here to show that it's important that the GGCP is implementing a free tree planting program in these areas. Trees are expensive, especially the size um, of the trees that the GGCP is planting, and many people do not have the time or money to devote to planting trees on their property. Providing the service of a free tree planting program gives people who may not have, even have trees on their mind, who are working or caring for their families or are retired, to reap the ecological and energy benefits of trees. So what's important to note here in this map is that a majority of Leominster's planting zone uh, falls within the 35 to 50,000 range in yellow, uh, which is below the median income for the city. So here we have a closer look at Pittsfield, which in the early 20th century had a population boom with General Electric moving to the city. Uh, General Electric's plastic division remains a large employer in the city, but is also associated with environmental issues regarding water and soil pollution. And because of that, Pittsfield is um, a center of environmental activism in the Berkshires. So like the previous slide, we have the 2018 census estimates, and we see that Pittsfield also shows metrics of the state average household income, or the average household income and education below the state's average. We see that the median income of Pittsfield is more than $10,000 lower than Leominster as well. Uh, we can also see that Pittsfield is whiter than Leominster and has a significantly smaller Hispanic or Latino identified population, uh, about 11% less than Leominster. And looking to the planting zone, uh, in downtown we see that significantly more of the planting zone in comparison to Pittsfield, or in comparison to Leominster, sorry, uh, falls in less than 25,000 category here in red, and then in orange, the 25 to 35,000 category. Again, we see the importance of having a free tree planting program in this area, helping people who may not have the resources to put a tree on their property and to experience the benefits of trees in their neighborhood. So here we can see the trees planted as a part of the Green Gateway Cities program in Leominster. Between spring of 2016 and May of this year, the Leominster tree planting team has planted 1,920 trees. We surveyed about 45% of these trees, uh, seen here by the green points on the map. Um, and this included a sample of trees on private property and all the public trees planted by the program, which ended up, ended up being about 50-50 public-private in Leominster. Uh, Leominster has a high canopy cover with Leominster State Forest and the National Valley Conservation Area to the east of the planting zone. And the planting zone canopy cover itself is also higher than what we have seen in previous years of studying gateway cities. And then in contrast to this, uh, uh, the, the citywide impervious surface uh, is pretty low in Lemister. However, half of the planting, about almost half of the planting zone is covered by impervious surface, which means that Lemister's planting zone is about half non-vegetative surfaces like roads, lots, buildings, or asphalt. So the tree planting team in Pittsfield planted 1,870 trees between uh, spring of 2016 and May of this year. Uh, we surveyed about half of these trees where about two-thirds of those trees were on private property and the remaining third on public property. Pittsfield's canopy cover is a little lower than Leominster's canopy cover, but is still greater than half of the city's total area. And the planting zone canopy cover is also lower than lower in Pittsfield. Pittsfield impervious surface is lower than Leominster, but similarly, almost half of the planting zone is covered by impervious surface. Again, meaning that it's covered by roads, buildings, or other paved surfaces. 
So looking at these two cities, we want to answer the question, what are the biophysical and social networks that influence tree health in the Green and Gateway Cities program? We also want to see how these, tree, how these results compare to previous years of research in the program. We explored this question by breaking it down into the tree survey and interviews. For the tree survey, we asked what is the survivorship of the trees planted in Lemonsters Pittsfield, and Pittsfield, as well as how tree health compares across cities by genus, location, and tree characteristics. Uh, for the interviews, we asked how do actors communicate amongst each other, how tree stewardship is approached and implemented, and what are the discourses associated with the Green the Gateway Cities program. So now to talk about the methods of the tree survey, I'm going to hand this off to Ben. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm here to talk about the uh, tree survey methodology and our results. We divided all the Green the Gateway City trees um, in one city into public and private trees. We surveyed all of the public trees such as this eastern redbud here on the left. Um, because there were so many private trees, we used a stratified random sample. We split them into quintiles based on the percentage of trees per property, with 20 random properties per quintile. An example of a private tree here would be this white fir. In this example, you can see a map of a neighborhood in Lemonster. In this area between 5th and 6th streets, you can see we measured all of the public trees represented by these blue dots and only some of the properties with private trees as represented by these green dots here. The private trees that were not included in the survey are shown in red, like these ones here. We had a number of measurements and assessments that we used when gathering data about the trees. These included mortality, Vigor, which I will explain in a few slides, site type, land use, height, diameter breast height, width, and distance to impervious. This slide here shows a data collection sheet that we would use to record the tree's information. Additionally, it includes room for additional information in the form of tree notes and comments. For our purposes, mortality would be divided into five categories. Alive, standing dead, which was a tree that had died in place. Um, removed, which was a tree that had been removed. For this, we had to look for some sort of trace of the tree having once been there, such as a hole. A stump, which was just the stump of a tree remaining, either alive or dead. And unknown, which would be a tree that we couldn't find any trace of being planted. We used a scale of 1 to 5 to measure vigor, a general metric of the tree's health, taking into account canopy and other elements. 1 down here represents a healthy tree, with 5 here representing a dead tree. The site type describes the immediate surroundings of the tree. We used front yard and backyard in the case of a residential building. Sidewalk planting strips were used for a tree planted in the area between a sidewalk and a roadway. Sometimes the sidewalk cutout was also used. The maintained park was used for park light, landscaped areas, and apartment complexes, housing authorities, or other large buildings like city halls or hospitals. Other maintained area was used for a landscaped area where it was unclear who the area belonged to or was maintained by. The land use describes the ways that the land around the tree is used on a larger scale. We had two types of single family residential areas, both attached and detached. Attached was a building with two to three units, and, uh, and detached was a building with only one unit. Multifamily residential area, designated area, would be an apartment complex, for example, a building with four or more units. In contrast to the site type, a maintained park would only be a park maintained by the city or another agency. An institutional land use, for example, would be a school or city building. 
And I'll talk about some of our results, uh, Shannon Rowe and Vivek Chen. Good morning, I'm Vivek Chen. I'm Shannon Rowe. Now we'll be taking you through the quantitative analysis of the tree data we collected in Lemus and Pittsfield this summer. This graph displays the distribution of the tree genera planted in both Pittsfield and Lemus as well as the top 10 planted genera. The top 10 genera planted account for 47.9% of all trees surveyed in Pittsfield and Lemus As you can see, the top three were acer or maple trees, quarters or oak trees, and liridondrum, which are tulip trees. The overall range of the top 10 is from 138 to 65, which is a fairly large range. Uh, now we're going to be looking at genera distributions in each city individually. So this is the distribution of genera surveyed in Lemonster. The top 10, 10 genera uh, in Lemonster did differ from the overall top 10 showed in the previous slide. Um, so here, Malice and Carpenus, which were crabapple and hornbeam trees, accounted for a greater portion of survey trees than maples and oaks in Lemonster. The top 10 tree genera account for 43% of tree surveys, and the individual accounts of these 10 genera range from 50 to 30, which is a fairly small range in comparison to what we observed in Pittsfield, uh, which Novak will discuss. So this chart displays the distribution of the genera of the survey trees in Pittsfield. <coughs> as you can see, the top two genera plant planted are uh, the same as the overall top two planted for both cities, which are Asia and Quarters, uh, Maples and Oaks. In Pittsfield, the top 10 genera account for 60% of our tree survey, and the individual genera account range from 101 to 34. This is a very large range in comparison to Lemonster's top 10 genera, indicating that the top 10 genera in Lemonster were more evenly distributed than in Pittsfield. So here we're comparing the mortality distributions of all trees surveyed to those observed in cities surveyed in 2017, which were Holyoke and Chelsea, and cities surveyed in 2018, which were Fall River and Chicopee. In the context of percentage of living trees in surveyed um, cities in the past, our overall percentage is fairly average at 88%. The second largest category of mortality um, observed was removed trees, followed by unknown and standing dead at 3% each. Now we will look more closely at mortality distribution for each city. In Lemster, the percentage of living trees was 90%, which is higher than our overall average of 88%. Removed trees remained as the second largest category at 6%, followed by standing dead and unknown at 2%. Of all the living trees, almost 80% were healthy, with less than 8% considered moderately or severely unhealthy. So now looking at the mortality distributions in Pittsfield, we can see that the percentage of living trees is lower than the percentage observed in Lemonster at 87%. Um, in Pittsfield, the percentage of unknown trees is, is larger than in Lemonster at 5%, and removed trees also count, accounted for 5% of surveyed trees. Within the percentage of living trees, the distribution is similar compared to Lemonster, but Pittsfield does have a smaller um, portion of severely unhealthy trees and more moderately unhealthy trees than in Lemonster. Here we're comparing the site type compositions of Lemonster and Pittsfield. In each city, residential trees, including backyard and front yard trees, account for approximately 50% approximately of the site types. The maintained park site type is much more substantial in Pittsfield at 31% compared to in Lemonster at 20%. So these charts compare the land use compositions between the two cities. In both cities, about 70% of the land use in our survey area is comprised of private trees, which include single-family residential attached and single-family residential detached, as well as multi-family residential. Furthermore, the multi-family residential land use category is larger in Pittsfield at 20% compared to only 11% in Lemonster. So now we'll be going through an analysis of tree health. So here we display tree health by mortality and vigor in the context of site type. It should be noted that the y-axis of these graphs doesn't begin at zero, but 15%. Um, across the x-axis, the acronyms represent the following site types. 
backyard, front yard, maintained park, other maintained area, sidewalk cutout, and sidewalk planting strip. Looking at the mortality graph on the left, we see that at least 85% of trees in each site type were alive. The sidewalk cutout site type has a relatively high portion of standing dead trees. However, the sample size of the sidewalk cutout site type was only 12, so it's difficult to make a definitive statement um, about this trend. We believe that this may be a result of the impact of impervious surfaces being in the vicinity of tree plantings, which we'll go into in greater depth uh, later on. Looking at the bigger graph on the right, we see that sidewalk cutout site type has the lowest portion of trees with a vigor of one, which is indicative of a healthy tree. Um, the sidewalk cutout category also has the most even spread of vigor assignments, but the sample size, again, is low. All other site types present fairly similar distributions, aside from other maintained areas, which appears to be healthier, again, with the lower sample size. So now we'll be analyzing housing in the context of land use. It should be noted that the y-axis of the graph begins at 60% instead of zero. Across that x-axis of the graphs, we have commercial, institutional, maintained park, single-family residential attached, single-family residential detached, multi-family residential, and vacant lot, these categories. Looking at the mortality graph on the left, you can see that all land use categories have a living percentage is over 80%. The institutional land use category has the lowest living percentage, while the vacant law category is completely living. However, the sample size of the vacant law category is lower. Now looking at the bigger graph on the right, we see that all land use categories had around 60% of their trees assigned a bigger of more, which is indicative of a healthy tree. The institutional land use has the lowest percentage of healthy trees, followed by the maintained part category. We speculate that this observation could be due to a maintenance issue for public trees, seeing as private trees appear to have larger percentage of trees assigned to bigger. So here we're looking at tree mortality and bigger by tree type. Um, of the surveyed trees, we categorize them into three different tree types, the first being evergreen trees, and then we split deciduous trees into two different tree types being shade trees and fruit or ornamental trees. Again, the base of the y-axis for these graphs is 60%. Uh, looking at the mortality graph, all tree types display living percentages of at least 80%. Fruit and ornamental trees have the lowest percentage of living trees and the largest portion of removed trees. Shade trees appear to have the best survivorship with over 90% living trees. Uh, these trends have a p-value of 0 0.0028, indicating that they are statistically significant. Moving to the bigger analysis, we observed at least 75% of trees of all types were designated with a bigger of one. Evergreen trees appear to be the healthiest, however the sample size is smaller than those of the other two categories. Shade trees and fruit or ornamental trees have similar bigger distributions, but shade trees do have a larger portion of standing dead trees. These differences observed based on tree type are statistically significant with a p-value of zero. These charts display an analysis of tree health based on the native status of the tree. Again, these charts begin at 60% on the y-axis. In the mortality graph, we can see that all categories of native status have at least 80% of the living trees. Natives have the highest percentage of living trees, around 90%, and the hybrids or unknown trees have the lowest percentage, around 80% of life. However, the p-value for these trends is 0.1117, which indicates that they are not statistically significant. Therefore, these trends are not outside of any more in terms of mortality based on native status. Moving on to the bigger distribution, the native and non-native category have similar distribution, while hybrid or unknown category mostly consists of trees designated with a bigger of two. However, the sample size was relatively low. Again, these bigger trends were not statistically significant with a p-value of 0.0855, meaning that these trends are unlikely to be observed by chance. So these are the top 10 uh, most planted genera overall displayed with their sample size, survivorship percentage, and mean bigger. The top three genera planted were maple, oak, and tulip, with their Latin names Acer, Quercus, and Lariodendron displayed on the slide. 
All of the most planted genera display survivorships over 76% and have average vigors below two, which is indicative of good overall health. Uh, these five genera, birch, cherry and plum, yellowwood, witch hazel, and dawn redwood, all have survivorships of 100% with a sample size of nine or greater. Um, we chose nine as the minimum sample size, as that was the median sample size for all genera surveyed. These are the trees with the overall lowest survivorship, with, again with the sample size of at least nine. The standard three genera, sweet gum, tupelo, and ball cypress, all have higher sample sizes in comparison to ironwood and silver bell. It should be noted that the sweet gum trees were among the top ten most planted trees, while having one of the lowest survivorships of trees with sample sizes over nine. However, seventy-six point three. Point three survivorship is still somewhat high. So now we'll be transitioning into a more in-depth analysis of the impacts of tree distance to impervious surface, which we abbreviated as DIMPS. Um, we categorized DIMPS into three groups, at 0 to 5 feet, 5 to 10 feet, and over 10 feet. This was based on lit literature written by James Urban from the American Society of Landscape Architects which described um, that trees with five feet or less um, between an impervious surface could potentially face growth or health inhibitions. Um, this graph presents an analysis of residential site types, including backyard, front yard, and side yard trees from both cities um, the, in the context of a distance to impervious surface. Uh, so here we see that the zero to five foot range does have the lowest percentage of bigger one designations, as well as the highest percentage of bigger three trees, which we suspect is due to the proximity of these trees to impervious surfaces. Um, the trend did have a p-value of 0.0198, in indicating that this is a statistically significant trend and is less likely to be observed by chance. Now, these graphs present an analysis of distance to impervious for non-residential trees, which includes maintained park, sidewalk <coughs> planting strip, sidewalk cutout, medians, and other maintained areas. The vigor distribution for non-residential trees are fairly similar, all having at least 70% of the trees in each thick category with bigger destinations of more. Things of 5 to 10 feet has the lowest portion of the unhealthy trees. The key value for each trend is at 0.1192, which means this data is not of statistical significance and is more likely to be observed by chance. Now, th this graph presents a general analysis of overall health of trees in maintained areas compared to street trees. Maintained areas include maintained parks as well as other maintained areas. And street trees include street trees in sidewalk, cutouts, planting strips, and medians. When not taking them into account, our data shows that street tree site types have a significantly higher percentage of living trees based on a p-value of 0.0012, indicating statistical significance. Therefore, this leads us to believe that planting more street trees would not result in more unhealthy or standing dead trees overall based on this data. <coughs> this could also imply that different stewardship routines are kept for street trees in regard to their high percentage of living trees. So this is just a brief summary of the trends shown in our quantitative data. Um, Lemonster had a higher survivorship overall, and this is likely due to the greater amount of unknown mortality designations in the city of Pittsfield. The genera planted in Lemonster displayed a more even distribution. Based on our data, residential tree with dips of less than five feet have lower vigor values, but street trees have higher overall survivorship than maintained non-residential trees. Fruit and ornamental trees have significantly lower survivorships than other tree types, and shade trees have a significantly higher vigor. Health based on native status did not produce statistically significant results. Now we'll be handing it over to Sadie and Cindy, who will bring you to our qualitative data analysis. bring us back to our research questions. How do actors communicate amongst each other? How is tree stewardship approached and implemented? And what are the discourses associated with the program? We collected, we called 148 property owners and scheduled 
33 interviews, but conducted 50 interviews in total. 17 of those were impromptu interviews collected in the field. Interviews were conducted mostly with residents, but also with five businesses, three organizations, five city officials, and one PCR forester. We interviewed Lemonster's community partner, uh, Growing Places, and Pittsfield community partner, Beat. We interviewed a variety of different city departments in Pittsfield that actually, that actually accounted for four out of our five city interviews. We wanted to see how representative our interviews were, and the takeaway from this graph is that Pittsfield, which is shown in the darker blue, is more representative than Levenster, and that our interviews failed to capture the high Hispanic or Latino population in Levenster. A couple of the other metrics that we looked at was income, education, and age. In these categories, our interviews were much less representative. For example, Lemonster is 55% over the median income, and Pittsfield was 80 to 95%, which is a much more stark difference. Additionally, both leaned older, and interviewees were disproportionately educated for Lemonster and Pittsfield. However, with Lemonster, when comparing that it to the average of Massachusetts, they were well below on income and education levels, making them fit the profile for the Gateway City, if not fit the median for Lemonster. Pittsfield was about a little bit above the average of Massachusetts so much more disproportionately representative. We used a theoretical framework to talk about our analysis. It's called the policy arrangement approach, and it was adapted from Park and Yoon's paper in 2003 on urban policy making. It deals with four dimensions of the pyramid, starting with actors, which are formal and informal actors participating in the policy decision making, the who, then there's resources, which is the how, or the description for how resources are distributed that lead to differentiations in power. Then there's discourses, which is a shared understanding of the world or environment, or the why, and the rules of the game, which are the formal or informal rules of policy making. It's the what or the when. So this is a diagram that depicts some of our major roles of stewardship and communication between the actors and that we've observed in the Lemonster and Fiscal DGC programs. At the top of the hierarchy, the DCR forces are the main points of contact between the DCR and the other actors in the program. The forces are in charge of um, tree stewardship and also tree planting. For and they stewarded well, they stewarded many of the GGC programs during the program. Um, the city represented in yellow is uh, includes the mayor's office and other city agencies. They supply information and resources to the DCR for tree stewardship and communication, such as office space, storage space for equipment, and also communication and networking data. The community partner shown in blue is the local nonprofit group that is specific to each gateway city. Their main role is to is community outreach through education and the production and distribution of marketing materials to promote awareness of the program. The tree recipients at the bottom, at the lower part of the hierarchy includes the housing authority, the residents, and businesses. These actors receive the trees and are given stewardship of, of private and some public trees as well um, from the foresters. The arrows represent the strength of the relationships between the actors. Darker and thicker arrows indicate stronger relationships and lighter, thinner arrows indicate weaker relationships between the actors. The strongest relationships are between the DCR and community partners, between the DCR and the city, between the DCR and the residents, and also between the community partners and residents. These are the most important relationships within the formal networks that apply the program. Most actors communicate with each other in some form, with some lines of communication being weaker than others. We will now be using interview posts to, be, to describe some of the relationships between actors. Um, community members outside of the formal net program networks have played key roles in communicating with each other. This quote here is an example of a surprisingly strong communication line that addresses some gaps in communication with residents. Involvement with the, Ameri the Spanish American Center in Lemonster effectively increased accessibility to underserved groups that were not reached by community partners. This quote from the city of Lemonster 
is an example of how city endorsement of the program has also played an active and essential role in promoting the program to the public. We found that the mayor's office strongly communicated their support for the program. In this diagram, uh, if this diagram was just representative of Lemonster, we would have probably found that this relationship era would have been a bit stronger because our interviews in Lemonster indicated stronger communication between the city and the residents. And so the residents also formed relationships with the city to get information and to get involved with the GGC program. One of the biggest gaps in communication was outreach to landlords and renters. This first quote is an example from a community partner. <coughs> Landlords were the most difficult to reach because they were not on the property and renters often felt like they lacked accessibility to become more involved with the program. Community partners in Lemonster have tried to address this challenge using mass mailings that were modified specifically to apply to renters and landlords. Together with the city, they were able to determine addresses of property owners who often own multiple rental properties. The second quote is an example of many people who also suggested addressing another gap in communication by reaching out to high school students and other youth programs. This quote highlights some of the key roles of communication between the DCR and community partners. Although the community partners take a leading role in, com in community outreach and accessibility, the DCR also collaborates closely with community, part uh, with community partners in canvassing, educational events, and marketing materials. This produces an effective relationship that fosters teamwork and inclusion between these two actors. Now we're going to move away from the communication network to focus on stewardship. Over here you can see what is a well-stewarded public tree, and over here is a well-stewarded private tree, and we're going to return to that pyramid triangle approach for this analysis. We used a software called Invivo to to code parts of the interview to various aspects of this triangle in order to analyze them. We're going to start with the actor's corner, answering the question of who has stewardship of the trees. Of course, residents are stewards for private trees, but public trees are the responsibility of the city, often the DPW. In reality, in Lemonster, there's an official woman who takes care of the flowers and unofficially takes stewardship of a number of the trees which isn't something, and also in Lemonster, the DCR was helping steward many of Lemonster's trees, which wasn't something that was happening in Pittsfield or necessarily in all the cities. Again, because it was more of an unofficial stewardship. Pittsfield also has unofficial support of a retired arborist, but in Pittsfield, there was a much greater or more frequent concern expressed for the anxieties of who would steward these trees after the DCR left and speaking to an uncertainty about what actors would be taking stewardship. Finally, a major group that isn't often able to steward trees is renters. They might not have yards or be allowed to or have good relationships with their landlords. Next, we're going to move to resources, which is resources involve time, involve water, involve knowledge, involve <coughs> space. They answer the question of how do actors steward. Residents are provided with a guide from the DCR that they generally say they try to follow, but besides the watering, they don't feel comfortable with the other forms of tree care, such as pruning or mulching, in spite of the guide. On the city level, neither Pittsfield nor Leominster felt as though they had the resources in terms of time and in terms of money to take full stewardship of all the public trees that they were responsible for, but unlike Pittsfield, Lemon Store does have the resource of space. They have a great centrally located office and storage space, whereas Pittsfield uh, was much further away, and this space can influence the time that they are, the resource of time that they have to steward these trees. Now we're going to move into why, which is why do actors take stewardship or not take stewardship of trees? On our survey questions, we asked residents what was the number one factor affecting why they took care of their trees, why they took stewardship of their trees, and it was overwhelmingly shade, as you can see here. The other top three reasons were um, aesthetics, energy benefits, and wildlife, and as you can see, there was a bunch of other reasons. Let's be honest. <coughs> the most common response we heard from residents for the questions why they took care of their tree outside of the ranking was because we don't want it to die, but we also heard a lot of them feel really strongly about the environmental impacts, about increasing the air, about spirituality, love of wildlife, or of course, shape. 
Now, the city has tended to take a more macro view, very fo focused on community aesthetics, was the one that we heard the most, and also community spirit. For example, in Lemonster, there was a large ice storm over a decade ago, but we still heard about it from residents and city officials. It was an example of how a natural disturbance like that can provide a strong reason why people want to steward a tree, and even years later, it was still impacting the discourses around tree stewardship in Lemonster. So that was really now, finally, the final corner of the pyramid is rules of the game, so the informal and formal rules that are that determine the stewardship of the GGC trees. The more informal rules of stewardship are provided by the DCR. They include things like watering it with 15 gallons once a week being the main source of water for three years, and that was provided by the DCR to the residents detailing how to take stewardship. Interestingly, there are actually some laws or formal rules that govern stewardship, Renters and housing authorities talked about how they were not allowed by their landlords to take care of the trees. And as a matter of fact, there would be a number of standing dead property, standing dead trees that hadn't even been moved on where we actually, in, at this housing authority where we conducted this interview. Uh, and of course, many residents, as you guys have heard in years past, talked about the uh, planting boundary, which is an informal rule game that is imposed on by the DCR. Specifically, residents were frustrated when it would cut a road in half leaving people on one side of the road to get trees and people on the other side not to. So this is a word cloud generated using a word frequency analysis and it represents the most common themes that were coded as benefits of the GGC pro from the GGC programs from combined Lemonster and Pittsfield interviews. So three at the center of the cloud there. Green trees was, was the most common being attributed to the benefits of the program, particularly from residents and city officials. They received trees that would have otherwise been too expensive to invest in, particularly for cities that were able to use the grant money to develop public parks. In the center of the cloud, we also see the words foresters, love, and helped, which were often intertwined as a common theme expressed by residents, city officials, and community partners. Many people appreciated that the foresters were considered, considerate about their preferences and also followed up and addressed tree health concerns. And so people loved the foresters because their communication helped them feel more secure and confident about their trees. Lastly, shade also popped up, popped up again over here. And that's because it, is, it was still a primary benefit of trees indicated by residents. This is a word cloud that represents some of the most frequently mentioned challenges associated with the GGC program. The keywords here generally reference tree care and maintenance. These challenges were emphasized as a general concern about added expenses, leaf cleanup, and a lack of knowledge and time. There was also concern for residents who were not as able to take care of their trees because they were either hindered by health or age. One of the quotes also refers to also refers to the aftercare of, um, of trees, meaning after the end of the program, many individuals <coughs> emphasize concern about the future health of the trees that were planted through the program. So now, just to leave you on some of the takeaways that we have here, um, trends across both cities. The first was the lack of funding and infrastructure outside the GGC program, made it hard for our cities to feel like they could fully take stewardship. Um, officials from both cities actually admitted that they don't water the trees as much as they said that they would. For the public trees, um, and in both cities, but Pittsfield assists officially, the DCR is the only active group doing tree plantings, and so there was some anxiety, like Cindy said, about maintenance once the program leaves. In Lemonster, the strong community partners and the variety of actors that were involved in tree stewardship proved to be invaluable, but in Pittsfield, a lot of them talked about being really disconnected from the state and feeling like the state never came out like past Springfield, and actually that was one of the huge benefits of the GGC program, because many people were like, yeah, the state is here, we see the state, we never see the state, so that really meant a lot to the residents of Pittsfield to seeing the state active in their city through the GGC program. Communication is a consistent challenge for the actors, raising awareness in the city, but also and especially reaching out to landlords, renters, and underserved groups. 
And finally, residents have overwhelmingly positive perception, perceptions of the GGC program with desires for shade, energy efficiency, and city beautification. City stewardship is more often more influenced on a macro level to create a community space and is more often hamstrung by resource limitations. Uh, we will now hand it over to our colleague Ryan. Ben Ryan, sorry. <laughs> All right, now just moving on to our conclusions. Our findings about the biophysical factors and the social networks that influence tree health in the GGC program can be split into two different sections, tree survey and interviews. We found that a large number of tree genera can be associated with a higher tree survivorship. Predictably, we also found that tree bigger classes were influenced by site location, mostly site type. Additionally, we found that distance to impervious surfaces has a significant negative effect on the health of trees, especially within five feet. We found that residential trees receive better stewardship than trees in other types of locations. We derived this same sense from the interviews too, as we found that residential trees tend to be healthier because residents are often invested in their trees. When comparing the results from this year to previous years, we found that the trees surveyed in 2019 had a higher percentage planted in maintained parks. In contrast to last year, we found native trees to have a higher survivorship than non-native trees. With regard to tree types, we found that evergreens have the highest survivorship in contrast to last year, which saw fruit and ornamental trees have a higher survival rate. Additionally, we found that shade trees were more likely to be unhealthy, in contrast to the fruit and ornamentals from the year before. You can see that several of these were found to be statistically significant, <coughs> as indicated with an asterisk. Based on our findings, we have some observations and recommendations for the program. Both residents and city officials express concern about who will be able to maintain the trees once the Greening the Gateway Cities program and the DCR leave. We heard from residents, city officials, and DCR employees that they wished that more could be done to reach landlords. Additionally, residents expressed that they wished that more could be done to reach out to underrepresented actors, such as high schoolers or groups like the Lemonster Spanish American Center. Finally, ensuring a wide distribution of species being planted could go a long way to mitigate the spread of invasive pests. During the school year, the HERO team have several personal research projects that we will be pursuing related to the work conducted this summer. You can see these here. We would like to thank the leaders and volunteers from Beat and Growing Places, the resident and stakeholder interviews, as well as the residents of the cities. Additionally, we would like to thank the cities of Lemonster and Pittsfield, the DCR, and our fellow researchers from UMass Emerson. Here are some of the references that we used during the presentation. 